we're going to look at an example of property-based testing. I'm going to show Quick Check, which is the tool that I work with. And the idea here is you want to test software. And that's very important to get software right. But thinking up all of the cases that you want to test is not something that's very popular with software developers, actually. And so it's often not really done as, as thoroughly as you would like. And uh, what I'm going to show you is a tool that we can use for generating tests so that instead of running maybe, you know, uh, a few dozen tests that you make up by hand, we can run hundreds of thousands or millions and get much more confidence that the software really behaves the way that we want it to. I've got a little example which is going to test uh, text message encoding. So this is actually a part of the 2G uh, telephony standard, so it's, it's quite old. But um, the people who introduced text messaging, uh, they were just making use of some spare bits that was in the packages. And they wanted to fit as many characters as they could into a text message. And there was only so much space. So they realized that they only needed seven bits per character, and so that's what they decided to use. But when you put those seven bit characters into the messages, you have to fit them into eight bit bytes. And that means that you can fit eight characters into seven bytes. So of course, the standard says you must do that. And that means that when you have a message you want to send, you have to encode it by packing the bits closer together. And when you receive it, you have to decode it. And here I've got um, some code that came from a company in France that does that encoding and decoding. So let me just start by showing you the code that we got. So here it is, this is Erlang code. And um, this is the code for packing characters. You can see there's plenty of it. This is the code for unpacking them again. And there's plenty of that. And we're not gonna look in detail at this. The only thing I want to point out is that there's a lot of code and it's complex. So it's quite easy to imagine that there might be an error in there. Uh, so of course we need to test that. And uh, down here we have some test code and what it does is it says, well, let's just take a sample message. Let's try packing it and then unpacking it. And what it, we'll call that T. And at the end of the day, what we get after unpacking must be the same as the message that we started off with. And then there's a little test suite here that says, just try that for a number of different strings. And somebody's thought about this a little bit and they've tried all lengths of message from zero up to 10. So, you know, Hopefully, if it works with these strings, that it'll work in general. So what we can do now is just um, compile that program, which I've just done. And now I can run that test code. If I do so, then we get some output, all of the tests passed. So that's good. It seems to work. But of course, what, all we've demonstrated is it works for these particular 10 strings. So you might wonder, if we give it some other message, is there a risk that the code won't actually work as we expect? So that gives us a chance to use a test generation tool. And uh, when we use QuickCheck, if I go back to the code here, I actually have what we call a QuickCheck property. This is the way that we uh, write test code with property-based testing. We write something that's supposed to be true in general of our code. Here I'm saying for all messages, all messages, not just the 10 in that test, which are lists of seven bit values. So they're made up of seven bit characters. Then if I pack that message and unpack it, I should get the message I started off with. So that says the same thing as the test that I had before, but it says it in general. And that means that now I can use QuickCheck to generate as many tests as I like and, and make sure that the code still works. So let me go back to my test execution window here, and uh, I will just use QuickCheck, I'll call it, and I'll give it that property that I just showed you as an argument, and we'll see what happens. Whoa! After only a little more than 100 tests, QuickCheck found an example in which the property doesn't hold. And what you see here is, first of all, a randomly generated message. It's a, a sequence of bytes, which appear as numbers here. You can think of it as, as a message. And that message was not packed and unpacked correctly. So after finding a random example like this, QuickCheck goes on to simplify the failing case as much as it can. And we end up with this message. Uh, which is just eight zeros. So why does QuickCheck say the problem occurs with eight zeros and not, for example, seven zeros? Well, because if you have seven zeros, the code works. Right. So this is the smallest example that doesn't work. And if I run QuickCheck again, you'll see that it starts off finding a different random example, but when it simplifies the test case, 
we get the same eight zeros. This is one of the key things about this kind of property-based testing. You always get the simplest case, and because you know it's the simplest, that tells you a lot about what the problem might be. Okay, so, so it seems to be something to do with being eight characters long. So maybe it works for all other lengths. So what I can do is I can investigate when the code fails now by changing my property. So if I go back to the property I had here, at the moment it says, for every list of 7-bit bytes, packing and unpacking gives you the same result. Now I'm going to add an implication. I'm going to say, for every list of 7-bit bytes, provided the length of the message is not 8, then it should work. So my hypothesis is that the length of 8 characters is the problem. So let's just test now messages of other lengths. If I do that, I'll just recompile my test code and rerun quick check. Now 2,000 tests passed. So maybe I was right. Uh, I'll just run a few more tests, which I can do by running tests for, let's say, 10 seconds. There we are. Oh, it still doesn't work. So now we find another example where packing and unpacking failed. And this is actually consists of 16 zeros. So maybe it's not just being of length 8 that matters. Maybe any multiple of 8 is also a case that might fail. Let's, let's investigate that. I can go back to my property and I can change it to say that um, provided the length is not a multiple of 8, that's what that means, then packing and unpacking the message should give me the same result back. And if I recompile that and run the test again, now quick check is discarding some tests. That's what the crosses mean. So running a lot of tests, every dot is a passing test, or by now every dot was 10,000 passing tests. The crosses are tests that were a multiple of eight. Quick check has not found a failing case after 185,000 tests. So that suggests that we're right, that as long as the length isn't a multiple of eight, then the code works. But I can also investigate the problem more closely. I know when the, test, when the message is a multiple of eight, then the code sometimes fails, but does it always fail? Well, let me go back to my property, and I'll just take that out, put true there instead, which does nothing. Instead of generating any list of, as a message, I'll just generate lists of length eight. So now I'm focusing testing on the case I'm suspicious of. Is every message of length eight coded wrongly? Let's find out. I'll run these tests. So now every message has length eight. And what do you know? Some of them passed, 38 tests passed. Obviously, many things are correctly encoded, but this example is not, and nor is this example. Now I want to look at the random example that failed, and let's, let's look at a few more of them. One of the nice things about generating tests is you can see a lot of different examples of the same thing. So is there anything in common between that first example, this other one? You can see that's full of different values of, of numbers. Those are all different, but oh, wait a minute. Look at the last number there, and the last one here, and the last one here. They all end in zero. That's very unlikely to happen by chance. So maybe the code works unless the message is a multiple of eight in length and the last character is zero. Let's test that hypothesis. I'll just change this, still to run tests of length eight, but to say, provided the last character of the message is not zero, then the code should work. Okay, so am I right in my hypothesis? Let's find out. Whoa! Now all of the tests are passing, and after 10 seconds we'll see we run 222,000 tests without a zero in the last position, and they all passed. So that's strong evidence that the hypothesis was right. Okay, so now, without even looking at that complicated code, we understand the problem very well. We know it happens when the message is a multiple of eight. We know that it happens when the last character is zero. And if we think about it, we can actually understand why this is happening. When we pack a number of characters into bytes, there are always going to be some bits left over. What happens if we pack seven characters into seven bytes? What happens is that there are seven bits left over. Seven zero bits. That looks very like eight characters where the last one is zero. And that's the problem. It's a problem in the standard. It can't distinguish 
between a message that contains eight characters with a zero at the end and a message that just contains the first seven. And it's a known problem, so uh, there's no way around it, except I suggest not putting zero characters in your messages. We realized that we were all working with very much the same kind of programming language, but because we each had our own compiler, we couldn't share any code. We couldn't share our results. And that just seemed like a waste of effort. So that led to the proposal to just take the common core of what we were all doing.